Good morning. Thank you very much, Martin, for uh, the introduction. And as well, thank, thank you to all people responsible for this uh, great opportunity to be here on this, uh, what already seems to be a very inspiring workshop, uh, as I believe. So uh, it's a great pleasure and honor as well to be here today. Um, I think that um, as, as far as I can see, uh, at least something that uh, I was about to say has been said already by Francisca in her very nice introduction. And I uh, think uh, that uh, this will happen during these two days quite often that we are going to say similar things by slightly different words because many requests and many troubles and many problems and barriers are already somehow in the air and uh, we just we are just trying to grasp the the core of, of the barriers and opportunities so this is what uh, i'm trying to do as well with my uh, talk this morning i would like to start with a picture and uh, steph uh, might recognize the picture from one of my uh, previous presentations maybe someone else as well uh, but I, I have used it uh, only once, and this is the second time. I, I think it uh, illustrates some of the presuppositions behind uh, my talk and uh, behind this workshop as well. There's a man uh, uh, explaining to his son that he is a social scientist, uh, and that means uh, he cannot explain electricity or anything like that, but uh, if his son ever wants to know about people, his father is the man. So uh, there is some kind of gap between social sciences and the rest of the sciences, the proper sciences, so to say. Um, and this gap is uh, something that we would like to overcome, at least in the context of this workshop. Um, we should aim to overcome the gap uh, because, as we already heard, uh, the development in contemporary academia makes it clear that we need each other, uh, or at least we, the social scientists, and I, I can uh, say it as a sociologist, we definitely need um, language technologies and ICT, information and communication technologies. But as we have heard already, creators of the technologies need users, of course, as well. And they need to know what the users are trying to do with the technology, with the, with the tools that are being created. So in my talk today, I will try to identify some of the barriers and uh, some of the opportunities ahead of us in uh, our collective pursuit today and tomorrow um, of exploring the spoken word data in oral history archives. So this is the structure of my presentation, of my talk. Um, hopefully I will be able to provide at least some preliminary sketches of uh, some of the features uh, of the field uh, of the oral history of the field that we are about to explore today and tomorrow. And much of what uh, I am going to say has to do with the distinction uh, of oral history as a resource and oral history as a topic. So I would like to make uh, clear what it means uh, in my understanding and uh, mention some of the premises and uh, implications of this dichotomy. But first of all, um, one definition of an abbreviation. Uh, for the purpose of this, uh, of this talk, uh, I'm using oral history in a general way. Uh, the term, um, I'm using it uh, as an umbrella term for all digital archives of uh, audiovisual recordings of interviews conducted with an explicit reference uh, and in accordance with the oral history methodology. So this is uh, what I'm talking about when I say oral history. To explicate the difference between the oral history as a resource and oral history as a topic, let me use this figure. Uh, in the middle, there are some research, uh, there is some research question. Uh, for example, how did people react to numerous clauses in Czechoslovakia? before the World War II. Uh, and then we try to answer the question, 
by consulting various data and materials, be it archival newspaper, historical study, documentary footage, or oral history interview, as we have already heard uh, about the different kinds of data that are being made digital as well by the aim, uh, by the activities uh, of the Clarin Eric infrastructure. Um, so the difference, in fact, is quite simple. Um, in case of the oral history as a resource, oral history is one of the materials or data uh, used to answer a premeditated question. In case of uh, oral history as a particular topic, oral history itself is the question. Whether as a method or as a discipline or as a social phenomena or as the specific setting of one particular interview. But the oral history gets to the middle as a particular topic of a study. From my experience um, as a coordinator at the Malach Center for Visual History, most users usually treat oral history as the data resource. They use it as sometimes the main resource, sometimes supplementary material for their research question. This uh, approach is, uh, so to say, the more conventional and far more widespread. And there are also, uh, also more tools available for satisfaction of the needs of users working in this uh, modus operandi. To look uh, on the dichotomy from a slightly different perspective, uh, let's look at it in relation to the assumption that there is some kind of relationship between oral history and the past that is described during the course of the speech, during the oral history interview. Now, the approach that I have called oral history as a resource gives primacy to the past, which is uh, being more or less unproblematically accounted for during a recorded interview. In other words, the speech is a reflection of the past reality. In the other case, the case of oral history as a topic, the relationship is uh, much more problematic. The primacy is usually given to the oral history and also to the relationship between the linguistic representation and the reality, which becomes the topic itself. I'm not going any further here because these details are well beyond the scope of my talk. Uh, I would like to summarize so far Oral history as a resource has usually a pre-existing research question, which is independent of oral history itself, so to say. Uh, in uh, the user practice, oral history it, um, often leads, uh, the using of oral history often leads to search for particular fragments of interviews, and oral history is usually combined with other archival resources. Whereas uh, oral history as a particular topic explores the oral history itself uh, as a recording of specific social interaction. It explores the nature of this or related or similar phenomena. And sometimes, but not necessarily, it may lead to some methodological implications and suggestions for the practitioners of oral history, for the people who conduct oral history interviews themselves by researching oral history as a situation, we may get to some um, suggestions or implications for the methodology of the discipline. But it's not the primary cause for such studies. So let's uh, dig a little bit deeper and provide some examples. The pre-existing research question, which is independent of oral history itself, as I have mentioned, is typically located within the stable disciplinary borders. There could be questions asked from the perspective of sociology, such as national identity or revenge or other topics. Uh, there can be a question formulated from the perspective of historiography, such as everyday life during the communist era or the Prague Spring of 19. Uh, 60s or 1968 especially, and so on and so forth. Psychology, such as coping with trauma, survivor's guilt, emotions, and other disciplines. The search for the answers usually takes 
the form of search for particular fragments of interviews relevant for certain topics. Typically, this is being achieved by using metadata or index uh, or uh, by using full text search tools. Interview is in fact conceived from this perspective as a specific kind of text which contains the answer, or at least we hope it does, uh, for our research question. An oral history is combined with other or archival resources, so there is no epistemological difference between the oral history and other resources such as newspaper, materials, and so on. And the interview is approached as a clear account of past reality, more or less, by the users. To give a specific example, actually almost an empirical one from one of uh, many users at the Malach Center, uh, there is an exemplar of how many users use oral history in their own work. So for instance, the question may be, what can I learn about the publication of magazine Kamarat in the Theresienstadt Jewish ghetto? Uh, so let's go to the oral history archives to find out if anyone speaks about the magazine. Yeah, there is a keyword, uh, cultural activities in Theresienstadt. That's nice, but that's too general for my purpose. So let's try full text search because this is something that's possible. Let's try it. Let's try to search for terms magazine and camarade. Oh, I found some mentions. Now let's write it down and go to the memorials museum and to the archives to find something more. And the last step is to bind it all together to have an image of how the things happened and write down, for instance, a bachelor's thesis, which was this case. So this is how it usually goes uh, with the users uh, in uh, the Malach Center for Visual History, from my experience. Now, I would like to go a little bit further uh, and try and use this duality to identify some of the barriers uh, in facilitation of using digital oral history archives in practice. Because, um, as Michael Frisch noted uh, some years ago, the deep, dark secret uh, of oral history is that nobody spends much time listening to or watching recorded and collected, collected interview documents, unquote. And after a few more lines, he adds, quote, this is not really a secret, of course, quote, unquote. Uh, so yeah, this is not a secret. Many people know it. Actually, it is uh, one of the main reasons behind this very workshop. So what are the barriers from my perspective? And more importantly, is there anything we can do about them. First, um, there is the uh, something that I would call the epistemological barrier or barriers. This barrier is uh, related to the multiple answers to the question of what is the status of oral history as a resource. As you may well know, social sciences and humanities are profoundly fragmented fields with many differences um, and many paradigmatic controversies leading to diverse theories and research practices. So in uh, social sciences and humanities, but I think especially in the social sciences, but th that may be because that's, the, that's my area of expertise. Um, there is no subject that at least a majority of the practitioners of so social science would agree, at, um, not, um, not one. Uh, there are different perspectives, different opinions, and uh, much, of, uh, much of the s discussions about social science are, uh, in fact, discussions about the core approaches towards social reality itself, because it's all um, related to the perspective of a person. So the theories and the research practices are a result of this fragmented nature of social sciences and humanities. And the answers to, the, to this question, what is the status of oral history as a resource, are very different quite often. And this applies to other topics as well, such as, should we reuse oral history data at all? Is it possible to get anything valuable from the secondary analysis of the interviews? Is it possible to gain some relevant and new insights from the interviews? Is it better than, or at least as good as, conducting our own interviews, or better than following different research procedures? These are questions 
that uh, are not always answered affirmatively, as you, many of you know. So these barriers are very important and um, quite complicated. Because if someone is skeptical in answering any of these questions affirmatively, he or she is much, much less likely to use oral history at all, the archived oral history. Uh, we can do, unfortunately, quite little about these epistemological barriers. It seems that the fragmentarization of, uh, and multiplicity of perspectives is a fundamental feature of social sciences and humanities. But uh, we can be still optimistic. People's opinions on using oral history certainly does change over time. And this usually happens when they realize that they can't go around these resources anymore in relation to some particular research topic that they are researching. So what we can do here is motivate people to get involved with oral history somehow and try it uh, to overcome the initial reluctance. Now let's move on to the next layer of bar barriers or complications. When a person acknowledges that uh, she can use oral history effectively, in other words, answer these questions affirmatively, she's facing or he is facing methodological issues. Fundamentally, these issues stem from the question, how should I analyze the oral history data? Once again, there is no universal procedure of analysis, including the transcription, uh, which, uh, contrary to common belief, is already part of the analysis. Transcription is not an objective description uh, of what is being said. It's not uh, part of the data. For instance, yesterday uh, we have been talking uh, about conversation analysis. And if, if you have ever seen a conversation analysis transcription, you know it's very different from a transcription used, for instance, in oral history or in journal interviews in the newspapers. Uh, so the transcription itself contains some um, parts of the approach to analysis. It describes the speech in a certain way to capture it in a, a specific way needed for the researcher. Uh, so even the, such a seemingly simple task as the transcription, it's not simple, of course, but uh, seems trivial uh, in, in its core, can be approached very differently by uh, different researchers. And the needs of different users might be very different, which is the result of the epistemological differences. We may focus, as users may focus, either on content, context, or the form of the speech. And each of these uh, invites different ways of asking questions and uh, different ways of treating the data. But there are also some more fundamental questions, such as how do I locate the most useful oral history collection for my research topic? Uh, is it readily available and accessible online or offline? Does it allow me to use the data in the most suitable way for my research? What can I actually do with the recordings in the online environment? Are there any ethical or legal limitations that I have to take into account? And how much do I know about the context of the interview recording? All of these questions are fundamental for different ways of using oral history data in research. Good news is that we can do something about these barriers, uh, but the problem is still the fragmentarization and multiplicity of perspective. As we can see, the different opinions on the epistemological status of the oral history data lead to different methodological approaches. From the perspective of the more advanced tools, every researcher needs something else. As, uh, and we can illustrate this uh, with the case of transcription, as I have said, it's not just an objective tool, but it is a very crucial part of the analysis. And Jane Elliott wrote in 2005, it is now widely recognized that it is all but impossible to produce a transcription of a research interview or any other type of conversation which completely captures all of the meaning that was communicated in the encounter itself. 
Any transcription of speech must therefore be understood as a compromise, and it is a version of reality itself. So we will get to some implications later on. In other words, there is always much more going on in the interview recording uh, than one may capture. And to capture at least something, one has to select what is relevant and what is not. And the relevance is judged on the basis of some theoretical presuppositions. And if there is such a problem with the transcription, imagine the more interpretive tasks and the more interpretive parts of the analysis. However, once the epistemology is settled by saying oral history is fine, it's useful for me, and methodology is settled by saying I know more or less how to approach and analyze oral history, there is still third layer of barriers. And these are the barriers of technological tools. In other words, the practical doing of the analysis, practical action or actions of the research procedure. Here the core question is, what is there to make the analysis easier? Of course, for some of us, the people from social sciences and humanities, uh, the information technology is a barrier by itself. But uh, more seriously, it's uh, more important to be aware that uh, the technical tools shape and frame the user's decisions. This means that the available technology shapes the way uh, users approach the data. And it also influences the way users ask questions. We ask the questions that we think of as questions that we can answer through the available technological tools. On the other hand, too many different tools and too many options can easily overwhelm the user and might even scare them away, in a sense. And furthermore, there are concerns like uh, how much can I do in the oral history archival interface itself? I don't have so much time to learn things about the specific tools. Is it worth it? Does everything work properly? How can I learn about how it actually works? Who, tel who tells me how it works? Where can I find it? Can I download the interviews and analyze them in the external software tools that I am already familiar with? And how much will it all cost? These are the practical, technical, technological questions related with using oral history in research practice, and these are some of the barriers that we are aiming to overcome. The good news is that we can do a lot about these barriers, or at least our colleagues in the IT can do uh, a lot about these barriers, and we have to collaborate about it as well. And we need to foster and uh, cultivate the space of intersection of the supply and demand, as uh, I may say, and uh, the collaboration of ICT and human sciences within the digital humanities. At this point, I'm getting to the second part of my talk here. Uh, the second part is a little bit shorter, less analytic and descriptive, and more imaginative and speculative, so um, I will carry on. And it will also con uh, contain no more cartoon jokes, so it will be more serious. <laughs> so let's go back to the initial distinction between uh, oral history as a particular topic and uh, as a resource. The opportunities or the explorations can be illustrated precisely by this, by focusing on oral history as a topic itself. I'm not saying there are no barriers in uh, approaching oral history as a particular topic. I'm just using it as an illustration of the differences in perspective. So in this, content, uh, in this context, we may ask questions like, uh, what does the oral history itself tell us about the world today, about contemporary society? We can focus on the macro-social aspects of oral history. What is the societal function of oral history as a practice? Is it somehow sign of the times? Is it somehow specific for the day and age that we are living in? What is the political and historical context of the interviewing process, of the interviewing practices? How does the context influence the interview? And then there are micro-social aspects. 
the interview itself is a situated talk in interaction. There are social psychological mechanisms involved. It um, employs narrative practices. It employs identity presentation and performance. So these are the micro-social aspects of the oral history interview as a specific setting. And simply said, oral history itself and the situation of the interview is the question of research. Or it is at least what uh, American sociologist Harvey Sachs used to call perspicious setting, um, which is an empirical or social situation, naturally occurring situation, which is particularly suitable for exploration of certain social practices and phenomena. So there are questions that we may ask uh, in a better relationship to the oral history because oral history leads us towards some questions as the specifics of the situations uh, show us certain aspects of uh, social interaction, for instance. We should notice then in that uh, in such cases most of the existing database tools like index or even full text search are not always very useful for we don't know in advance what exactly are we searching. Uh, the strategy rather is to get immersed into the data and wait until some interesting structures, topics, um, phenomena start and begin to emerge. Um, to illustrate one another aspect of focusing on the oral history as the subject matter, the digital technologies make it much easier to compare two or more different interviews conducted with one person in different topical setting and also in different socio-cultural or socio-historical context. Uh, context. This man on the pictures is Leon Greenman, as you can see, born in 1910, who became famous, famous as the only Englishman in Auschwitz concentration camp. And uh, in the Center for Visual History Malach, where I work, we have, uh, there are available two interviews with this person. The first one is from 1995, conducted by the USC Shoah Foundation for the Visual History Archive. The other one is from 2004, so there is nearly 10 years between those two interviews. And in 2001, Mr. Greenman also published uh, a book called An Englishman in Auschwitz. As you can see on the next slide, the comparison of, so to say, the same episode of his story shows us that there are quite major as well as minor differences. And still as a whole, the story or the episode remains the same. And this allows us to pose interesting questions about the very nature of narrative, the very nature of narrative identity. Uh, and its emergence from particular social interaction between the interviewer and the interviewee. But there is more. I'm not uh, spending much time with those two uh, excerpts, but uh, you can notice the underlined parts. And the underlined parts are uh, some information, some pieces of information that are not included in the other interview. And this is the interview with the same person about the same episode of his life, about the same event. So you can see um, the differences. But there is, of course, more, and there is much to gain from uh, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary collaboration. I believe that there is much potential in studying the digital oral history from the perspective of uh, human-computer interaction, and we have already heard this uh, expression today. So I think it would be very interesting to focus on the practical interpretive work that is taking place in different ways of using oral history, for example, by high school students. How do they uh, work with such an archive in practice uh, while they are searching for the answers for some particular questions that their teacher gives, us, uh, gives them? Language technologies in general remind us that uh, oral history is, uh, I would say above all, a linguistic phenomena. But there is as well the more recent 
uh, interest in multimodality and uh, in gesture studies, in facial expression recognition and facial expression studies. And uh, the oral histories, or oral history archives, of course, audiovisual oral history archives may help us to explore these questions as well. And finally, let me mention that in relation to the oral history as a resource, there are many transversal topics such as family, memory, language, violence, revenge, transitional, not transnational, justice, uh, and so on. So there is a potential for many interdisciplinary approaches, exploration of new fields of research, and as well conceptualization of previously unimagined fields, I hope. So how can we walk in the direction of these imagined futures and perspectives? The first step, I believe, is uh, to search for the answers to some basic questions regarding, as well, what is the relationship between ICT, language technologies, and oral history digital archives? And what is the way that we want them to be used by other people. But as I have already mentioned very briefly, the technology is not only a tool, but it also structures our perspective, our perception of the data and of the research opportunities. And this is something that should be also reflected. Next, uh, given the fragmented nature of human and social sciences that I have uh, described in the first part of my talk. Uh, are there any universal software tools that can be used in multidisciplinary projects? That's a question. Are there? I'm not so sure about it that some tools can be used by everyone. So the other question is, should we have some universal tools or only specif specific tools intended for particular tasks only? And can we imagine or create software that could really help in the stimulation of creative thought and lead us to ask progressive questions, not only look for the answers to premeditated questions and formulated questions in ad uh, advance? And to get uh, my feedback on Earth, um, I believe that uh, it is very important and also inspirative to transgress the boundaries of the qualitative and quantitative approaches in the humanities and social sciences, and this is something that uh, technologies help very much to do. And last but not least, we probably need as well to reconsider some of the foundations for our methods. Do we really need the transcript in the present day and age? If yes, what for? And if not, how can we transform the analytic methods that are relying on the written text as the data? And as uh, my time here uh, is almost finished, and I tried to be a little bit faster, uh, there is a brief summary. Uh, my intention here today, uh, having the great opportunity to be the first speaker, was no more than an attempt to outline some uh, of the features of the common field of this workshop and to propose some topics to focus on today and tomorrow. Uh, so I hope that I have at least partially succeeded and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion and discussions afterwards. And thank you very much for your attention.